Hello, I'm Dr. Ira Nash. Welcome to Well Said. Today, we're breaking from our usual routine and recording our show from the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell instead of our usual perch at the studios of WRHU Radio Hofstra University. The reason we're here is a special program coming up at the school called Spark of Creativity, an exploration of visual art and epilepsy. The event will explore the bi-directional relationship between epilepsy and the visual arts, exploring how patients use art to express and cope with their illness, and how seizures themselves can be the driving force behind artistic creation. The event will feature an epilepsy-inspired art gallery from local artists, an examination of epilepsy portrayal in film, and testimonial of several artists with epilepsy. We thought that was a great opportunity to explore these issues with you, and I'm delighted to have the meeting organizers of the show on our show with me today. So with us is Dr. Simona Proteza. Dr. Proteza is the director of the Epilepsy Monitoring Unit at North Shore University Hospital and an assistant professor at the Zucker School of Medicine. We have two medical students who are the kind of driving force behind organizing this exhibition. Patrick Tierney, he's a fourth year medical student at Zucker and hails from Pittsfield, Massachusetts and uh, looking forward to a career in neurology. And with Patrick is Justin Esposito, also a fourth year medical student at Zucker from Queens, New York, and also applying to neurology. He and Patrick are both in the humanities and medicine concentration, and as I said, are organizing the upcoming show. And I'm also delighted to welcome to our show, Daniel Hopper. He's the keynote speaker for the Spark of Creativity show coming up at the Zucker School of Medicine. Daniel is a photographer, a person with epilepsy, and as I said, the keynote in the upcoming epilepsy event. He's a native of Long Island, went to photography school at the Hallmark Institute of Photography in Massachusetts. Daniel now specializes in street photography and portraiture. He has an epilepsy photography collection entitled Seas, a depiction of epilepsy from the patient's perspective. His photography has been showcased at Babylon Council of the Arts in Babylon Village, the Greenpoint Gallery in Brooklyn, and the Long Island Photo Gallery in East Islip. Well, all of you, thank you so much for joining me, and welcome to Well Said. Thanks so much for having us. So I always like to start at the beginning. Uh, so we're talking about epilepsy. Maybe, Simona, you could uh, start by telling us what is epilepsy? Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for uh, being present here. And thank you for uh, paying attention to this uh, underserved population, I would say. So epilepsy is a disorder of the brain. Epilepsy is a condition in which a patient has more than one unprovoked seizures, meaning uh, se events, seizures in which you cannot identify an immediate cause. And uh, a seizure is actually an unexpected and sudden electrical disturb disturbance in the brain. And, you know, uh, I th I'm sure our listeners are familiar with how seizures are often portrayed in the media, in movies, television, so on, where somebody suddenly drops to the ground, shakes uncontrollably, uh, people get panicked that they're going to choke or, or have some other catastrophic event. Is that what seizures look like typically, or, or is that uh, kind of an over-dramatization? It is. Some of the seizures, they do look like that, uh, but there is a small percentage of seizures that look like that. Those are seizures that are very dramatic and uh, very uh, difficult to control, I would say. And those are also seizures that are diagnosed and identified immediately. But unfortunately, the majority of the seizures, and this is where the art for diagnosis come in, the majority of seizures are silent. They are undiagnosed for many years. Uh, people live with this condition thinking that they have a psychiatric condition, that um, they are just getting crazy, they are having hallucination. A lot of them get depressed because they are not diagnosed. And those are the silent seizures that, as I said, for many years goes undiagnosed. No matter what type of uh, seizure a patient have, and it is absolutely specific to each patient, what type of seizure they have, depending of the brain region of the brain of the brain region where the seizure originates. No matter what type of seizure a patient has, uh, a patient has to be properly diagnosed and uh, properly treated. So, if I understand what you're saying correctly, the manifestation of the seizure, what 
people around the person with, with the seizure sees or what the patient him or herself experiences depends critically on which part of the brain is affected by this electrical activity and how extensive that electrical disturbance is. Is that is That's that correct? correct. That's correct. And in adult population, seizures happen at any time, and between four and six millions of Americans suffer from this disease, and I think that many of them are undiagnosed. Uh, the majority of the seizure in adult population originate from the temporal lobe, which is a region of the brain that control uh, information, control auditory processing information, and encoding of the memory. Also, temporal lobe is involved in uh, uh, visual uh, processing uh, and in also memory and mood. A seizure originating from temporal lobe, by example, will exacerbate all these symptoms. Some, a minority of a patient will have very pleasant symptoms, um, very colorful life, uh, uh, light, uh, very distorted images, and a lot of them will have uh, unexplained fear, uh, very depressed mood. And post this storm, I, can, I think that I can, I can uh, uh, quote and say that this is like a storm in the brain. Post this storm, the uh, patient becomes very depressed, very sad, and very tired. Interesting. So the person who has a seizure may just experience this as a particular smell or a particular vision Correct. of something and not even know that they had a seizure. Correct. And that's Correct. why you said it sometimes takes a long time for these takes a to lot be time. diagnosed. And now we did advance because we do have tools in recording electrical brain activity and as a result disturbance in the electrical brain activity. So somebody, the patient has to recognize that something is amiss. Correct. Right. And then the clinician has to at least entertain the thought that those symptoms, which I guess, taken what you're saying, can be very varied. Correct. And think, oh, well, maybe that's a sign of abnormal electrical activity in the brain. Do the appropriate test to make the diagnosis. Tell us a little bit about the testing that's done. We do not have a perfect test for this condition. The gold standard is to capture one of these events on the EEG, which stands for electroencephalography, which is a test in which some stickers are applied to the uh, skull and you are, record, you are recording brain activity from different parts of the brain. If you capture one of these events and if the event originates close enough to the surface of the brain, you are going to have a change in an electrical recording. Sometimes seizure of short duration, duration originated in very deep structures of the brain are associated with normal electroencephalography. Hmm. And this is where the question comes, is it a seizure, is it not a seizure, how can you diagnose? Are there indications on the EEG, on the electroencephalogram, that something is amiss even when somebody is not having an active seizure? Correct. Uh, there are, um, due to um, prolonged uh, disturbed electrical activity in the brain, there are already changes in the brain and an uh, interictal meaning a recording between two seizures can be abnormal even in the absence of an event. And this can imply that a patient is at risk of having seizure from that specific So even the if brain. they're not in the midst of having this abnormal overwhelming electrical activity, you can sometimes discern yes. Yes. Uh, abnormalities. So let me turn to my uh, medical school uh, colleagues here. So um, what got you two interested in, in neurology, in epilepsy in particular? And, and uh, well, why don't we start with that? Sure, I can, I can begin. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of joke that, uh, believe it or not, I've, I've almost always wanted to be a neurologist. Um, I, I had a, a... As a cardiologist, I find that very sad. I just, <laughs> just want to say. I, I've gotten that before, yes. Yeah. Um, but but I, I grew up, my, my older brother, who's three years older, actually uh, suffered a stroke at birth. Oh. And so I had the experience of, um, you know, seeing what it looks like to have a chronic neurologic illness literally since, since birth. Um, and traveling with him to see neurologists and uh, to get care um, was 
an extremely imp impactful time in my life and sure. drove me to pursue medicine and, and uh, neurology. Uh, how, how is he, by the way? He's doing wonderful. Thank okay. you for asking. Good. Yeah, okay. you know, it's a, a testament to the neuroplasticity of a young brain, how well they can heal. Yeah. Um, but he's, he's wonderful, yeah. Um, in, in terms of epilepsy, uh, subsequent to the stroke, he, because of that neurologic insult, he then developed epilepsy um, as uh, an adolescent. And so, um, you know, being 10 years old or so myself and seeing my first seizure was something I'll, I'll certainly never forget. And um, it's, it's uh, become a, a patient population that I get a lot of value in interacting with and, and helping. And, and so it's why I'm so passionate about this cause and excited to, to continue my training in neurology and epilepsy um, as, I, as I move forward. Well, that's not great. Justin, what about you? Sure, yeah. For me, I think a lot of my inspiration of, of going towards neurology as a field was the, the patient stories in neurology. I think uh, it's such an interesting and unique uh, area of medicine in that the brain is capable of producing pretty much any possible sensation or experience that, that a person can. Um, and to have all the different symptoms and, and stories that we get when the brain is affected um, is, I think, kind of one of the most uh, interesting and, and unique parts of it. And I think that's part of what drew us to making this event, uh, specifically with epilepsy being, as Dr. Protease has already kind of touched on, seizures can really take the form of any kind of possible psychic, physical, or mental phenomenon that, that people can experience. Um, and we kind of, after talking about this, thought, you know, what an interesting connection with, with artwork and the expression of individuality with such a uniquely individual condition uh, that is epilepsy. So I guess that's kind of how my interest in neurology was almost tied together with my interest in, in forming this project with, Cap with Patrick as my, our capstone project. Yeah, that's great. So I, I do want to get to the connection that you two are exploring in this program between uh, creativity, visual expression, and, and epilepsy. But I, I want to follow up on something Patrick said that um, his brother developed epilepsy after a, a stroke, after damage to the brain. And um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the causes of epilepsy to, to the extent that we know. So, very, very well said to the extent that. Oh, well we said. I love yes. it when you say <laughs> yes, that. Yes. <laughs> and actually, despite the fact that Patrick made you uh, unhappy that uh, uh, he wanted to be a neurologist for me was the, the great, uh, <laughs> great thing. And so, and it is true, uh, we have a um, percentage of patients in which we can identify a cause, and we, cause, uh, we call it. We are very simple as neurologists. We call it symptomatic epilepsy. We can find a cause. Sometimes it's a structural defect, a stroke at birth, which unlike the stroke that happened in adult life, usually is not associated with any physical evidence of uh, uh, motor or, or other functional dysfunction. Um, then we can have uh, uh, migrational abnormalities, some changes in the uh, gray and white matter in the brain. We can have benign tumors. We can have um, traumatic epilepsy. But in the majority of the cases, we don't find a reason. We call it cryptogenic epilepsy. We know that it, there is a reason. Sometimes we suspect that there is a genetic uh, uh, cause of epilepsy, but we cannot identify what's the cause. And uh, in, in general, I suspect that most uh, patients who, are, um, who have epilepsy are treated with medication. Is that the That's first correct. line? Uh, so um, patients are treated with medication. Um, the majority of them, 60% uh, of them, will respond to the first uh, type of medication that you start them on. Some of the medication can provide some benefit, but can provide some side effect, and then this will impact the uh, quality of uh, life of a patient. Uh, there are the 30% uh, uh, cases that do not respond to first line. They do fail second, third, fourth, and multiple lines of medication. And then we have to advance the uh, medical treatment to neurostimulation, to ketogenic diet, to resective surgery. And sometimes we have patients that continue to experience daily or weekly seizure despite the fact that they are on four, five, or six uh, medication. I'm a little surprised that you mentioned diet. Um, so d talk to me a little bit more about what's known between, uh, about the relationship between diet and, and seizures. Um, diet is maybe one of the oldest treatment for epilepsy, and it was uh, 
used in um, way more than thousands of years ago when they still believe that uh, the, uh, the seizures are secondary to a scene or they are possessed and like that. And in the, in the context of exorcism, the, the patients will be starved and the seizures will, will improve. Later on, we did advance in our um, understanding. We still do not have a precise mechanism by which starvation uh, can, can improve seizure control, but what we do suspect is that brain, we know that brain function with glucose, and in the absence of glucose, brain is going to use ketone body is going to produce energy by breaking down either protein or fatty acid. And ketone bodies do not require a transporter to cross the uh, membrane of the neuron, and it is less epileptogenic. And we did see a good seizure control. There are some data that might, uh, might interact with other neurotransmitters, but we don't have yet. Although you mentioned starvation, that doesn't sound like much of a bargain. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, so uh, are there specific diets that people can eat and get all their caloric sure. needs? And sure. So uh, we mimic starvation. Okay. So let me be less restrictive. <laughs> so we mimic starvation by decreasing the, the uh, amount of carbohydrates in the diet and increasing the uh, healthy uh, fat and uh, uh, medium doses of protein. Yeah. I, you know, it brings to mind a, a subject we've talked about on this show a number of times, which is the relationship between uh, the normal functioning of our bodies, whether it's the brain or other organs, and the content of the microorganisms in our gut. Uh, and I wonder if uh, there's um, something you want to say about the relationship between the microbiome and, uh, and, and seizure activity. It is. It is. In the beginning of exploring, we know that microbiome and seizures do, they are interconnected. We know that people absorb medication differently. They react to medication depending on their mi microbiome. We are a bit still far away from saying that we'll be able to completely change the microbiome to control the seizures, but I think that there is a strong connection. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, I, I want to get back to the program that's coming up at, at the Zucker School of Medicine, exploring the relationship between epilepsy and the creative arts, I guess, most broadly. Um, so um, maybe uh, I'm going to turn to you two again and, and ask you to just uh, explain that connection a little bit for us, and then maybe uh, we'll go into what um, prompted you to put on this show. So, uh, I mean, I think it, what we're interested in is, is uh, an, explora an exploration. I think a lot of, um, a lot of times the, the question um, is, is what initially prompts us to, to delve into an experience like this. And um, for, for Justin and myself, we were curious about how art relates to chronic illness in general. Um, with an interest in neurology, um, we, we certainly wanted to go in that direction. And then um, we sort of narrowed it down to wanting to also look at um, a neurologic illness that can affect the visual system. Um, and we thought about epilepsy and, and migraine, which also can produce visual auras. And we uh, eventually decided to, to go with epilepsy. Um, can I just interrupt you for a second there? Sure. You started by saying the connection between chronic illness and, and art. Uh, were you thinking more about how illness is depicted in art or how art can be stimulated by illness or, or maybe both? Yeah, exactly both. Certainly both. Um, I, you know, I think that, that uh, as Justin sort of mentioned before, with epilepsy being such an, an individual um, uh, oriented illness and it's, it's so um, non-uniform, um, I think that you know, looking at a disease like this um, in terms of how artists can express something that is maybe so difficult to do um, in, in words with, with visual art or um, in other modalities um, can be really valuable to understanding the illness experience um, from, from the, the patient side. And um, I think that, you know, you can also, I think there's, there's value in looking at how the illness itself may you know, inspire art to be created if, if an epilepsy or, or migraine 
there's you have these um, you know lights or these different types of visual um, hallucinations you might even call them that patients see um, you know what what that could look like to other people it can you know both maybe be beautiful but also um, explain a little bit about what it means to, to experience these these symptoms yeah yeah and I think I think Patrick touched upon like the visual phenomenon very well as well but I think additionally especially with as Dr. Prodi as I mentioned with the temporal lobe being involved and uh, how emotions can be part of these auras. So patients can have an aura that is just intense fear or intense anxiety. Um, and that's such a, a unique and strange experience, I think, to have an emotion just suddenly come on um, that it's, it's very interesting to look at how someone might describe that or express that emotion. Often I think patients with, with epilepsy might have difficulty trying to convey in words the feeling they're having, especially with something like, like involvement of the temporal lobe. Um, so I guess we were also really interested in, in how else do these patients try to express almost the inexpressible. Um, and I think that's something we saw when we lo looked into the history of uh, artists who have had epilepsy as well. So what did you learn as you started to explore this? Uh, and, and what do you hope to educate the public about by putting on this show? I think, I mean, I think there's still uh, lots to be learned, but I, I think, you know, we've we found that this is not something that's that's a new idea. I think uh, for hundreds, if not thousands of years, artists have been uh, portraying um, their experiences with epilepsy through art. Um, a really famous uh, painting but even goes back to the 16th century. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, what we've learned from it is that this has been something that people have been doing for a long time, and yet there's still um, so much stigma around epilepsy and such little education about it um, in the community and, and even in the, the medical community. Um, and so, uh, you know, some of our goals are to, to educate people about, you know, what epilepsy actually looks like and how it affects people, um, hoping that we can make people understand a little bit more um, what it means to, to live with epilepsy, but also um, to, to be able to empathize with, with uh, you know, neighbors and loved ones um, who, who do suffer from this disease. And, and Justin, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about exactly what the content of the show is. Sure, absolutely. Um, so it's going to begin with a gallery, um, which will be held uh, here at the medical school, uh, where we'll be featuring the artwork uh, kind of displayed similar to, to now, but with uh, some more pieces from Dan. Um, uh, that will be the first hour or so. Um, and then we'll be uh, moving to the theater for the second part of the event, where we'll, ha we'll have Dan speaking about uh, his experiences. Um, and afterwards, we'll be followed by a panel of uh, other artists with epilepsy. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about some of them. Um, there's also going to be a, a visual art piece featured from, we have a, a contributing uh, researcher artist from New Zealand who's actually contributing uh, current research she's been doing on stereotype portrayals of seizures uh, in media. So she'll be contributing that uh, as well in between the, the speaking so, and the So the uh, expressions of the experience of people with epilepsy, but also kind of an exterior view of how people with epilepsy are portrayed. Exactly. I think that was kind of our hope for the event, is that there'd be um, a portrayal of, of how different artists portray their, um, or express their condition, but then also how maybe that is uh, contrasted with how it's often portrayed in, in popular media. Yeah. So, Daniel, this seems like a good time to draw you into the conversation. Tell us a little bit about your personal epilepsy story. All right. Well, when I was 13 years old, I was hit by a car. And traumatic brain injury is another way you could develop epilepsy. So I was hit by a car, and two years later, I developed epilepsy. Um, I had my first seizure. I left school early, had a seizure, and had no idea what happened. I just remember waking up, and it felt like I tried to rip a tree out of the ground because I was just that tired and sore, something I wasn't really expecting. And then um, since then, we started testing, and luckily, we were able to tell where my epilepsy came from because of the car accident. So I had scar tissue on my brain that was causing a neurological disruption. And wh what kinds of symptoms were you experiencing? And maybe if you could hold the microphone just a little bit closer. Symptoms as in? W well, what was your epilepsy like? What, what did it feel like to you? What did it look like to others? Um, well, I have two kinds of seizures. I have grand mal and petite mal is what they were called. So a grand mal seizure is when what everybody in the media knows. You lose consciousness. You shake. You could throw up. You could foam from the mouth. Whatever. 
can happen, but it does happen. And then I also have Petite Mall where it's a feeling or a sense that it kind of just comes out of nowhere and it could be a smell. And from that point, for me at least, I was just not really shaking, but trying to hold back myself from shaking and losing consciousness. So you were awake during those other kinds of seizures? Yes, I would get a feeling. It's a different feeling. So I would automatically know that, okay, I'm about to have a seizure. From that point, I start to breathe, try and just find myself. And if I was lucky enough, I didn't have a seizure. But this was probably every other seizure that I've had was a big one or a small one. And how frequently were you getting these? Um, That varied. I think very greatly due to my mindset almost because if I was in a good state of mind, the seizures weren't coming as often. I know if things were working out for me at the time, what I was trying to do, I wasn't having many seizures. But as life happens, when things got tough, I would have more seizures. Yeah, let me just turn to our epilepsy expert here for a second and and ask how typical that is, that life circumstances, uh, stress, sleep deprivation, other kinds of things, how does that play into people's pattern of seizures? So what uh, Dan described is very typical. Um, When we say that seizure uh, disrupt all aspects of uh, our life, this is exactly what it is. Uh, so sleep deprivation, stress. Stress is not good for anybody, but in a patient with epilepsy will decrease the seizure threshold. Sickness of any kind, vi- viral illness, dehydration, uh, gastrointestinal illness can, can decrease the seizure threshold. And for a physician, it is easy to say avoid stress and to <laughs> continue yeah. your life like that. Sure. In a practical aspect, it's, it's very difficult. So this is where different types of non-pharmaceutical therapy, therapy in which you decrease the stress, you accept your condition, you, you are able, I think that this is for me, this is one of the most important part of this program is you you are not afraid to express your condition if you show your human part mm. you have a visual language so so if i may just kind of repeat what you're saying that that the acceptance of the condition actually may be therapeutic Yes. You find out that you are not alone. Uh, You find out that the symptoms that you experience, you are not, uh, they are not because you are different than anybody else. There are other people who are experiencing the same. Then they might find a way of dealing better with these experiences and to organize their uh, life better. As we said, um, stimulating different or overstimulating areas of the brain can give rise to different uh, sensation, good or not so good sometimes, then the, the, that region is depleted and that you, the uh, depression, the stress, the anxiety, the unpredictable but then said at any time a seizure can happen depending of whatever you are doing. You cannot plan in advance. Right, so life. I mean that, that must be yeah incredibly stressful in and of itself. Yes, It was difficult in and of itself to know you would have epilepsy. And like I said, um, for me, a seizure was, if I had a grand mal seizure, I would, my hand would start to tingle. And I would know automatically something was coming. And from that point, there would be a pain shoot up my arm and my hand would clinch up. And then I would just lose consciousness. Wake up on the floor and being told I had a seizure. And it's like you said, it's you have to accept it and realize and know that there's nothing I can do about that other than do stress and take my medications. And as like I was hit by a car at 13, I developed epilepsy at 15. So at 15, you're a teenager, you're a teenage boy, you want to play football, you want to go run out and hang out with your friends and you couldn't do that. So it took me a while to accept where mm-hmm. I was at and what I could do. And actually, photography helped me do that. Yeah, tell us a little bit more about that. Well, when I was 17 years old, a um, DJ company, the owner moved in next door, and I knew him from the town, actually. So he asked me if I wanted to assist him. I started working with him and then picked up a camera. And from that point, it was like 
it was almost a validation. I was appreciated for what I was doing, for my vision, and something that I've never really experienced before, that I was always just afraid that I was gonna have a seizure. So I was quiet, I was timid, I wouldn't talk to people, I would just stick to myself. Photography almost gave me a passage to go talk to somebody for no reason. I didn't have mm. to go have a conversation with somebody. I could walk up and make a new friend on the street just by asking them to smile. And from that, I kind of used photography as a coping mechanism and a way to almost separate myself from the anxieties of epilepsy. When I was feeling down or when I was upset, I would just, I would go for a photo walk is what I called them because as an epileptic or someone with epilepsy, you're unable to drive. They're not allowed to drive a car and living in Long Island is fun without a car. Yeah. <laughs> So I would go on three, four hour photo walks just around my town, walking around looking for something to take a picture of to kind of free my mind and separate myself from the stigmas and the anxiety of if I'm gonna have a seizure. And it was a little dangerous, I guess, because I was still having seizures, but I didn't let it hold me back. Did you find that engaging in photography and, and taking those walks actually diminished the frequency and severity of your seizures? 100%. It was, like I said earlier, I think for, um, seizures come from, not come only from a mindset, but it can be worsened with your mental state. And for me, photography and just taking pictures, even if it's a lake or of a person, of something, gave me that freedom. You know, it was, I was doing this for myself. Talk to us a little bit about the relationship between your epilepsy and the actual art that you produce through photography. You said doing photography was kind of therapeutic in and of itself. Was there a deeper connection between the images that you were creating and your medical connect uh, condition? I mean, I think for any artist, their mental mind, their mental state is going to affect what their artwork looks like, what it's about, and what it does. So I would say a hundred percent that. If I was having more seizures, or if, because I'd have more seizures, I'd be more depressed. So me being depressed or me being upset would change the whole style of my work, where I would be happy, good, like on a good day, I would go down to the beach, take pictures of the sunset, people at the beach. If I'm upset or if I was, I would walk down to the park, take pictures in the shadows and just show a different side of my life. Yeah. So. Um we are a radio show and a podcast, but we do have uh, behind us here some of your uh, photographs. And I wonder if you could just describe for our listeners um, the, the two pieces uh, t to my right. Okay. Well, the first one back here is a collection of my medications. Yeah. And so for our, our listeners, it's, gee, I can't even count how many pill bottles <laughs> there are there, but it looks like dozens Yes. Uh, piled in all kinds of different angles and a bracelet that says fall risk, uh, a medical bracelet. So talk to us about what you were trying to capture here. Well, the, the fall risk is actually every time you go to a hospital as somebody with epilepsy, they put that on you just in case because you are a risk to lose consciousness. And what I was trying to capture from this image was just to show everybody that if you don't know about epilepsy or any medical condition for that matter, you have to take a lot of medications. Now, I've had epilepsy for roughly 20 years, so I've been on a lot of medications, different ones. As we said, sometimes the first ones work. That wasn't my case. I've been on, I believe, 18 separate medications oh, wow. throughout this journey. And the medications is a very big part of epilepsy because if you miss one dose, your potential to have a seizure goes up a lot. And I would set alarms for them. And this image is just trying to capture the fact that as someone with epilepsy, medication kind of runs your life as well. Yeah. There's and and what about this other image? That is an uh, abstract image of an IV bag from the hospital. These, these images are a little dark and a little grim, and I apologize for that. <laughs> but the project I'm doing is called C's. And my intention is to show black and white images of epilepsy and what you go through, and then color images of friends, family, and life outside of epilepsy. 
something to the black and white and the color to separate the two and show direct distinction between. Interesting, yeah. Both of them. And this image here was actually taken at the hospital after I had a seizure. Um, it's just to show that there is always something there. It's always part of your life. And how are you doing now? Now I'm actually been seizure free for almost a year and it's been a lot better. That's great. And it, what do you owe, owe that to? Um, in all honesty, I feel like it was moving back close to my family and finding like just my niche in life right now. Yeah, which speaks to what we were talking about before, that there's uh, kind of a deep connection between, uh, I guess, what people would call mental or spiritual health and the actual brain health as expressed through uh, your, your epilepsy. I feel 100% like that's the truth because if you're not happy in your life in general, you're not gonna, your life's going to be difficult. It's if you don't have a positive outlook or if you can't find the good in something, you'll always find the bad. And epilepsy is kind of similar. It's just that dark cloud that stays over your head because when you don't find the good in something, your potential to have a seizure increases. Yeah. And it's, it's difficult at times, especially when you're younger, to know that you could have a seizure, you could embarrass yourself or whatever you want to think of. But it's... It's easier to get through it with help from friends, family, and people around. You know, you mentioned one thing that I want to turn to our medical students about again, uh, which is um, you said something about being embarrassed. And yes. the, the two of you both mentioned the, the um, stigma associated with, uh, with epilepsy and your hope to kind of address that. So, so Daniel, just tell us a little bit more about your experience as a teenager or as a, as a kid, and, and then I'll turn to you guys to kind of respond to that. Well, the stigmas of epilepsy, like they said, go back centuries, and you would thought to be possessed or whatever they wanted to say. It's, it's changed now, but it's still kind of, at least as somebody with epilepsy, when you wake up from a seizure, maybe because you're on the ground and everyone was yeah. trying to help, you feel self-conscious about it because now you look up and see the room standing at, at your right above you. Right. So even though it, like nobody might care, you're still subconsciously embarrassed. Yeah. And then there's, you can, with seizures, it gets pretty hairy because you can throw up, you could urinate, you could defecate yourself. And in high school, having something like that happen is traumatizing. Absolutely. And even though people might not make fun of you or they'll understand it, it's still something that weighs on you personally. Yeah. Guys? I would say that, um, Dan, that, that these sentiments and, and these ideas of, of uh, fears and anxiety about seizures are, are all too familiar, um, both in, in you know, patients that I've, I've interacted with, uh, but also on a personal level, seeing my, my brother. Um, he also, you know, going to... To, to high school and being so scared that you know today I'm going to have a seizure and embarrass myself and I, I think it you know for for him it was um, it was a challenge in that you know he the, the seizures themselves when when they happen and uh, especially when they're they're larger seizures like you mentioned that the grand malls that you have um, and for for people that don't know about seizures it, it can be really scary um, to see that. Um, and I think a combination of, of, you know, other people not wanting to be around a seizure and, and then the anxiety that that produces for you on top of that, um, that combination can make it really difficult to, to be in social situations. And, um, you know, research has, has looked into this actually about um, some of these stigmas that patients with epilepsy face, and, and they found that a lot of uh, uh, patients... Um, the, the vast majority of patients feel that they do have they, they do have challenges in social situations because of their disease um, and that they've been perceived as um, e either um, antisocial um, or even aggressive um, because of the seizures that they suffer from and so I think this is again where the this idea of education about what seizures are what epilepsy is um, is so important for for our community. And Justin, maybe you can uh, help us close out by just giving us uh, a rundown of how people can, 
experience this uh, this show and uh, where they can get more information about it. Sure. Um, so, I, so the, the upcoming event? Or yes. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, well, so there are multiple ways of uh, we're kind of hoping to have a hybrid event for this, both uh, virtually and in person. The in-person event will be at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine on January 20th, uh, starting at 5 p.m. Um, and then we'll be hosting at the same time a, a Zoom event. And we have a flyer with the Zoom link with which uh, people can register um, for that Zoom information, um, or they can also just come to the event at the medical school. Great. Well, look, I, I want to thank all of you for, for joining me today. I think this has been a really interesting conversation, and, and I hope it uh, generates a lot of interest in the upcoming event. Um, so for those of you who are interested in more, getting more information about the upcoming event at the medical school, we'll have a flyer about the event on the WellSed website. I also want to thank our producer, Connor Pilkington, and our audio engineer, John Mullen, for producing today's show. For more information about this program and to find past episodes, please visit medicine.hofstra.edu slash wellsaid. You can also subscribe to our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Our listeners are welcome to send comments, suggestions, and questions to wellsaid at hofstra.edu. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ira Nash, and that's Well Said. <laughs>